So let's get started. Just so you know, we do want to uh, to let you guys know who you're talking to. You're going to meet with myself. I'm the Director of Business Development at Ellipse Solution and Dennis Guriev. Dennis is one of our senior, our most senior architects. Uh, Dennis has been working uh, with the product through many versions for a long time. We go to the next slide. As a practice, go ahead and go to the next. We have been... Um, We've been working with uh, Dynamics AX since before the Microsoft uh, acquisition back around the turn of the century. So we have 23 years of ERP consulting experience. The last 12 years, we have been exclusively focused on Dynamics, on Dynamics AX specifically, and Dynamics CRM. The most important stat that you're looking at up here is the number one. All that time, we have one former customer. Those of you who are familiar with the channel know that there's constant turnover in the channel. Uh, people hire partners. Sometimes they keep their partners. Sometimes they become disenchanted with their partner. We have only had one customer move to another partner. Next slide, please. So here's our Microsoft competencies. It's important to know that we're a partner. We're an ISV. We actually have more uh, individual solutions on AppSource than any other partner or software publisher. And most importantly, we're a customer. We're currently on AX 2012. We want to move to Dynamics 365, but customers keep using our people to upgrade their environments to Dynamics 365. So when it calms down, we'll do it in-house. We're a gold certified ERP partner. We're also a, 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 a direct cloud service provider that was originally called a tier one CSP. So we can provide uh, direct from Microsoft pricing for our CSP clients. We're a certified development partner. Um, we're, we belong to both the Internet of Things and Power BI red carpet programs as early adopters of those technologies. Uh, we're not only a Microsoft managed partner and a designated Microsoft One commercial partner, but we've recently be as been assigned to uh, uh, what they call a, a heat list of 25 partners worldwide who stand by to co-sell with Microsoft field personnel uh, in the field throughout uh, North America. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we'll talk about uh, today is performance issues. And just to let you guys know, we do have a program to deal with performance issues as well as ad hoc functionality questions and break fix. It's a help desk for Dynamics AX and 365. There's very low entry cost. Uh, we know a lot of the plans out there make you pay big bucks out front. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, also, our hours roll over. Unlike most of our competitors, we don't have a use it or lose it in our help desk plan. Uh, we allow you to roll over unused hours. We also have guaranteed response times so that you can know and it's predictable when we're going to respond to any ticket that you file. We provide, of course, application support, break, fix, ad hoc functionality questions. And in this case, uh, you can open a ticket and say, I'm having problems with performance. So uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, let us know. We can also, for those of you on 9 and 12 and 4, uh, we can provide preventative maintenance service. We can take that from your IT team and do that remotely for you if you choose. All of this under the auspices of the Help Desk for Dynamics AX and 365 program here at Ellipse Solutions. So, okay, I've done my sales bit. It's time for Dennis to give you the information that you came here for. So, Dennis, let's hear it. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Gregor mentioned, my name is Denis Guriev. I am a software architect with Alex Solutions, and I've been working with uh, formerly AX, uh, now G365, for over 10 years now. Um, so the goal of this session is mainly to walk you through the entire process of reviewing the performance of the system. Uh, this uh, these slides, they apply equally to 2009 and 2012. D365 is slightly different, although if you are looking at performance of on-premise, perhaps, installation, it might apply as well. So I would uh, basically 
all of the information I'll be giving it equally applies to all versions of the system because uh, in general the infra the hierarchy and the infrastructure is fairly similar regardless of the version there are just a few things changing but otherwise uh, all the same facts apply so uh, I have dealt with several with many different instances of performance uh, of reported performance issues in uh, AX. I, I will refer to the system as AX from now on. And basically, it, it is never a case of one thing going wrong. Usually, when we look at any performance issue, we need to look at it as a complex problem. We need to always look at uh, the entire stack of things that might attribute to the perceived performance uh, downgrade. And we need to find which things might be at, at, at issue. So with that in mind, uh, some time ago, we, we went back to our help desk database and pulled out all the performance issues just to kind of uh, do a statistical measurement of, of our past uh, experiences with performance. And we bucketized all of the tickets that were found into these six groups that I'm showing on, on this slide. And basically the percentages, just to give you an example how spread out the issues are. In, mo in uh, almost all cases, the in initial report is almost the same, that this form or this report or this user experience is slow. But as we start looking at the report itself, and as we start looking deeper into the system, we then find what basically the cause is. But we have to go through all of these steps, uh, kind of monitoring all of these things before we can identify what the culprit of the problem is. And in many cases, the, the key is in one of the areas, but the other areas are also involved in some sense. So, the way I structured these slides, uh, I will go through each of these six kind of uh, bullet points, and I will talk about each of them uh, separately. But uh, the key point is, as you research your performance problems, you will probably need to go through all six of them. And over time, you will build, if you haven't dealt with performance issues, over time, you will build out experience of what, what the report might be leaning to. But if you don't have a uh, kind of um, deep experience with uh, debugging performance issues, you would probably need to go through each of them and weed out which of these are probably not an issue and which of these are more, more likely to be a cause of a reported problem. So, uh, the very first thing is the the very first thing is this the server configuration so in some sense i will talk about sql here but i i want you to make sure that you kind of separate two things right now we're talking about specifically the uh, operating system and even hardware in some sense setup with regards to performance the next bullet will be specifically uh, regarding the SQL uh, server settings, but in this in this bullet we kind of even though we're talking about SQL, we're talking about physical layout of SQL server. So uh, the very important thing is uh, to make sure that the hardware is set up properly, because if the most foundational level is not set up and uh, configured properly all kinds of issues may emerge. As I mentioned before, the reports about the performance downgrade will be almost the same as any other issue, but they can be deep-rooted into the improper uh, operating system setup or server setup. So the first thing is the SQL configuration. When we talk about the SQL server specifically, uh, there are some common best practices as to how it needs to be set up and there are many many different uh, uh many different guidelines that you can find on the uh the, that you can find with regards to sql configuration uh, one of the it's i i usually consider it 101 for sql uh 
SQL layout. If your server is not set up this way, you need to start looking at it right away because this is a very, very common and very important part of how SQL should be set up. So when we, when we talk about the hardware and SQL layout, it's very important for the data files, log files, and TempDB to be stationed on a separate spindles, on separate hard drives. The reason why that's the case is because when SQL is accessing data, changing data, and doing other operations, it it can parallelize the it can parallelize its own actions. And in many cases, if the any of these files, let's say data files and log files, reside on the same physical hard drive, same physical spindle. That will, would mean that the SQL uh, will start competing with itself. And it, I, I have seen many cases when this uh, degrades the performance uh, of the entire system, and it's very hard to pinpoint exactly where the problem is because SQL is basically, basically behind the scenes, just stepping on its own tail. So it's very important to look at these very, very, very basic uh, pieces of setup. So the next, uh, the next thing with regards to SQL uh, layout and kind of SQL hardware, I, would, I should say, is the specific SQL configuration. It's very important to also notice that the, there are many more. I just, in this, in this slide deck, I just put the most common things that we notice. When we do the review of, of client systems, we go through a, a very large checklist of things to verify. And these are a few most commonly misconfigured. Um, I will uh, probably for the, to, to save some time, I won't go through uh, into many, many details of, of all of these, but these are just, just examples. You need to make sure you, you understand if, if these four points, they're not the only things that could go wrong. So there are several other very important settings that need to be configured properly for the EX system. But these are the ones that we usually see uh, misconfigured, I would say. So the next thing besides the SQL, so first the slides were about the SQL server, but as you know, if you, if it's, you have used uh, AX so far, you know that there are other servers involved. So the other server type is AOS, Application Object Server. And it's very important to also pay attention at how object servers are laid out, because depending on your, uh, on the, your number of users, on the types of things, types of features you're using in, uh, in AX, and on your general system layout, it's important for you to properly uh, segregate, I guess, AOS uh, responsibilities. So one of the common practice that I usually encourage people to use is to uh, define AOS roles. Unless you have a very small installation, you probably have more than one AOS server. And I have seen uh, many, install uh, many implementations where there was no specific strategy as to how to AUSs are used. But this may play out uh, with regards to performance. What I'm talking about is the roles of AUSs specifically. For example, in, if, you are, if you have an implementation where you depend, uh, when you, where you heavily depend on bad jobs, it, it might be of, uh, of importance for you to look at segregating bad jobs on one AOS server and users on another. Same applies for external devices as well. The reason being is that you don't really want for users to experience performance downgrade when bad jobs kick in, for instance, or when multiple external devices uh, connect to the system. So moreover, if you have a very large installation and you have uh, dozens if not hundreds of users it's it's also i always encourage uh my uh encourage people to look at segregating AOSs by user role 
for exactly the same reason, because users use system uh, differently. It's not uniform use of resources, even with regards to users themselves. So, for example, finance people might do their uh, heavy, calculate, heavy calculations in the morning and then reporting in the afternoon. At the same time, your operations users might also do some calculate, heavy calculations in the morning. And in that case, if all of these users are sharing the same AOS, that AOS, is specific, that AOS uh, performance will specifically downgrade, while some other AOSs might be fairly idle. So it's very important to look at this uh, kind of a trick to segregate AOSs per role. But it's also sometimes, uh, if you don't have too many AOSs, you might actually put a kind of a, you, uh, the uh, different kind of lightweight users on one AOS and heavyweight users on another one. So it may not be by department necessarily, but by usage of the system. And Another part with regards to uh, setting up your AOSs is you might want to look at load balancing. Uh, there are different types of load balancing strategies, and I will quickly kind of mention each of them. So one is the um, setting up a cluster. In that case, you set up, a, uh, basically you group AOSs into a cluster, and when user tries to connect to the system, the cluster will dictate which AOS they go to. So in that case, you, you, you basically bundle up all the AOSs together and user, users will be dealt the, uh, the AOS that's least used at the moment of login. The other way is to set up a cluster without a dedicated server. It's approximately the same operation. You just don't have a, a dedicated load balancer. But another strategy is to fix uh, kind of fix user access and in many cases i deployed this, the the uh, uh, i deployed uh, aos structures exactly that way especially if users report performance problems the reason being is if you explicitly define where users go which aos aos as users access in that case you you have more specific control over how users will use the system. So it really depends on your number of users, on your specific uh, kind of uh, uh, specific knowledge of what users are doing in the system. And you can decide what's the best strategy for you to, to deploy users to your, the AOS. There is no right or wrong here. You need to uh, uh, always look at the specific, uh, your specific situation and decide which is the best strategy for you. So with that, we move on to the next uh, kind of bucket of, uh, basically the next point that, that plays into performance, uh, uh, into performance issues probably in AS or potential issues. This is another thing that needs to be done. Usually you need to always uh, make sure that you uh, take off these things ahead of time. If you already have performance issues, do look at these things. But even if you don't have performance issues, look at the previous point and this one uh, ahead of time. You don't need to wait for your users to report performance issues to look at this. These, all of these points, they apply equally to all systems, regardless whether your users perform, uh, per report uh, performance issues or not. Second point is SQL settings. And you, as you can see by the, percent, by, by the percent, percentage in the bottom of the, of the screen, we actually see these issues quite a lot. Uh, and the reason being is that this, uh, this point is underappreciated by the community in general. In many cases, people set up SQL, uh, uh, configure it, and kind of forget about it. And I will, I will talk in, uh, in the next slide a little bit more about the, this kind of, um, I guess, SQL versus AX SQL issue. But first is, uh, it applies to AX uh, implementations more than maybe other experience with SQL you might have had before. 
because uh, AX is a very complex system, and there are many things involved in how AX database is used. You are usually well advised to segregate SQL servers themselves. Obviously, SQL, SQL Server is an extremely complex piece of software on its own. It can definitely handle multiple databases in the same server instance. There is absolutely nothing wrong with placing several databases into the same server. But with regards to OEX, as I will mention in the next slide, there are many different things that might be different with regards to SQL Server setup uh, when it, it applies to AX compared to SQL uh, setup when it's uh, SQL config configuration, I should probably say, with regards to other uh, systems, be that OTP systems or reporting systems or otherwise. So AX, because AX is such a complex, uh, a complex ERP system, in many cases, the best practices with regards to SQL setup are different from other systems you might be managing. So you might be well advised to, to actually, if you have multiple databases you need to serve, you might be well advised to actually have different dedicated SQL servers uh, that you manage. Uh, you might host them on the same hardware, but if you have large installation, Maybe even that is not uh, the best option. Maybe it's best to have dedicated hardware for different servers. And the reason being is that the SQL best practices are not necessarily the same as AX SQL best practices. We have seen this over and over again through our years of experience with AX and uh, implementing the system. Uh, we have seen multiple uh, uh, implementations where the client would bring the experience, extremely experienced SQL personnel who dealt with SQL for many, many, many years. And they have a lot of experience to share. But they had experience with SQL, SQL in general, but not necessarily with AX SQL. And when we look at how they set up SQL, we see that they apply kind of standard industry practices to AX SQL, but they do not take into account the years of experience of Microsoft and partner networks with AX SQL itself. And the best practices are actually different. Just to give you one example, uh, it's, a, it's a very common misconfigured option in AX. If you go and just Google this, you will find a multiple, a multitude of articles talking about this setting. The setting is called a maximum degree of parallelism. And if you look at the, at the articles, if you read about the, the kind of guideline, how to set this, this specific setting up, if you look at the guideline with regards to SQL in general, with no regard to AX, you will see one set of kind of uh, uh, best practices, uh, if you will. But if you find the white papers published by Microsoft or discussed on the partner network, uh, on the partner hosted blog, you will see that this setting is actually, uh, the best practice for this setting is different for a yet SQL servers. And it has to do with how a system is managing transactions and with how the multiprocessor systems will better access, should, should access uh, the, uh, basically should spin the parallel processes when they engage with, with transactional operations on the SQL level. So this is just one of the examples. There are many more that need to know when you set up your SQL server uh, settings. And when these settings are misconfigured, that can cause a general system performance downgrade. And it's not a specific issue that you will see. You will just generally see kind of sluggishness of the system. And users might, might uh, kind of report some specific forms that are being slow, but in general, the root cause might be in these settings alone. And it's just simply that the users who report the issues are the ones who are, uh, if I may say, fed up with the, with the issue. And other users may experience the same issues as well. They just don't 
report them yet. Now, the next thing is, the next uh, kind of point with regards to performance is maintenance of your system. So I would encourage you to set up in your, in your organization a maintenance plan. When we manage our implementations, we, we have a well-established uh, well uh, maintenance pra processes that we encourage our clients to, to use. As they have, have evolved over many years, we've used them in many implementations, and we kind of uh, added over time different steps that we encourage people to perform when they maintain the system. These involve different things. Some of them you might have kind of done in your system. Some of them you may not have. And the we're talking specifically about the periodic maintenance. Obviously, in some cases you will be pushed by the windows, by the some kind of a I don't know routine uh, uh, rep uh, reports management uh, from from the user uh, from the, from your user base. That, for example something is not installed on your system, you want, might want to install and restart the system. But even if you don't have a need for the maintenance, you should plan for the periodic maintenance of your system. There are several uh, kind of reasons to do this, but besides the more of obscure ones, the most common ones is to, you should always be on top of your Windows updates. You should always kind of, uh, keep SQL kind of healthy and you should always keep keep a an eye on the event logs on all of your servers. But I will talk specifically about some of these in the next slide. So SQL maintenance. This should be your bread and butter of your uh, of your periodic maintenance. When you set up your periodic maintenance, this is probably what you should start with. Uh, besides Windows updates, obviously, for the security reasons. Uh, SQL maintenance is extremely important. Uh, when SQL is not well maintained, I have seen diff uh, many different types of performance uh, degradations over years. And many of them, they are not to the fault of the SQL itself. They are not for the fault of the person who set up SQL or who manages the SQL even. These things need to be explicitly defined in your organization. If you don't know any practice uh, of, of doing these things, of maintaining SQL, kind of keeping SQL healthy, then you, you need to sit down with your SQL, uh, SQL uh, team, uh, IT team, whoever is managing this, and talk through, uh, through these things. Especially if your SQL team is not uh, is managing different databases, not just AX. Because AX is very susceptible to, uh, to, to different, I guess, over time degradation of performance. And, the period, and your periodic practices need to be tailored to this. So one of the key things that need to be maintained on the SQL side for many databases, but especially for AX, is statistics. So what are statistics? You may have heard about them, you may not have, but you need to know about them if you uh, are dealing with performance issues on any level. When SQL is operating, it's, it always keeps a kind of live, uh, live track of statistical measurements of the data in tables. So basically what happens is when, when SQL is in day-to-day -day operations of SQL, when, a, a, uh, when AOS sends a request to the SQL to get some kind of data or update some data, but in most cases when to query the data, to get a data out of SQL back to AOS to, to present to the user, SQL needs to make a split-second decision how exactly to pull the data from, from a specific table or tables. And to do that, SQL keeps track of so-called statistics. It's a statistical measurement of layout of data in a table. It might say something like, I have just a few records in this company, in this data area ID, but I have a lot of data in, the, in other company. Basically, the data distribution is completely skewed towards one data entity 
uh, company in AX or or, or uh, organization uh, versus another. And knowing that, SQL will choose a proper execution plan to serve that query. Because if you want to query from a small company, from small organization, you might uh, employ one way of pulling data, but if you're going against the large uh, entity, a large company, you might need to go through uh, through several indexes to pull the data, basically. And the key point is, if the statistics, if these kind of uh, counts of statistics, statistical records of the data are skewed, then all of these problems, uh, then SQL will not be able to select good execution plan to serve the query. So updated statistics are extremely important. If statistics in any tables are skewed, the uh, performance of that table might degrade uh, and very quickly. The other thing, the other thing that needs to be maintained is the indexes. Uh, you, this one you have probably heard many, many times. What indexes are is the kind of snapshot, the key, the sorted snapshot of the data. And when SQL tries to pull from large tables, it resorts to, to indexes to 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 get a quick to to get a quick kind of snapshot of where exactly in the large data table the data is so it doesn't need to 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 it doesn't need to traverse the entire data file to find that piece of data so indexes could also be skewed this applies to kind of both both indexes and statistics but especially additions and deletions are the ones are the actions that skew indexes they also skew statistics, but statistics are usually skewed just generally over time uh, with even small changes to data. But indexes are very susceptible to large insert, insert and delete actions. If you inserted a lot of customers, let's say, in a company, that index might be outdated and need to be uh, recalculated or even rebuilt from scratch. So these are two things, uh, statistics and indexes, that need to be always on, you need to be always on top of them. If, if once they get outdated, your system is almost guaranteed to, to, uh, to observe performance problems throughout the user base. But in many cases, it's specific queries that start perfor performing poorly. And specific user base will start reporting issues. But it will be very hard to track it down because it's kind of hidden deep into the inner workings of the SQL server. And just as a kind of a anecdote, uh, when I was preparing this presentation originally, I, I went and just a few days before that, I actually had a, I was talking in internal Yammer group with, with someone and I found that some, uh, someone posted a, a kind of a request for kind of help, I guess, for to the user, to the partner and Microsoft community. And basically that some of their forms were not operating well. And when I, and I kind of just generally replied to, have you actually happened to insert a lot of data in that table? And apparently that was exactly the case. So it's, it's just a kind of a case in point that uh, sometimes even these kind of, uh, innocuous actions to the, uh, apparently innocuous actions, inserting data into the tables might completely degrade certain parts of UI, accessing UI uh, in, in the system because an index got uh, grossly outdated or statistic got grossly skewed. And in these cases, you might have, in D365, you might have timeout. In 2012 to 2009, you might have this spinning wheel experience when the users look at the screen and it's not loading and they don't know what's going on and the screen goes white. So all of these things, they might be caused by simply uh, large deletions or insertions of data, large changes, uh, kind of large scale changes to the data and uh, outdated statistics, uh, indexes and, uh, and uh, kind of to the like. So the next bullet point is server sizes, sizing. 
as you can see by the percent in the bottom of the screen, we actually don't see too many issues with that in our database. But when I engage, when I get a report, especially a re initial reports from a new client about their performance issues, I in many cases see that uh, it's it's kind of intuitive to look into something. It's intuitive to to think that if you have a problem with a, uh, with performance, you probably have a problem with 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 your servers, with your sizing of the servers. It's very intuitive. I completely understand. I always, uh, uh, whenever I hear of a performance, my brain reacts the same way. I always think, oh, maybe the server is not scaled properly. Maybe we need to add some more RAM, some more CPU. But it, as you can see by our help desk system statistics, help desk database, it's actually fairly rare that the server sizing is the problem in, in reports that are related uh, that were relayed to us over many years. But it's still important to, to know this. It's still important to make sure that your sizing is adequate, your your server sizing is adequate. Obviously, if, if the servers are uh, not up to the standard, they will cause performance. But at the same time, I need to caution you from jumping onto this and saying, oh, you, you, the user reported this problem. Let me add more RAM. This, in many cases, is not going to solve anything. But if you see that your servers are sized on the kind of lower bound, maybe you will be better served to kind of adding more resources to these servers. Even if this will not solve, solve your problems, this might at least alleviate kind of the frustration of researching, basically trying to battle performance problem that is rooted in two things at the same time, in server sizing and something else. So it's better to get this out of the way uh, right off the bat. So you don't need to deal with the server sizing when you research your problem. So um, basically the these are kind of the uh, on, on, in, in this table, I just showed the official requirement and kind of the uh, what the Microsoft recommends. If you hit these requirements, you are probably fine with your uh, with your service. But I will kind of show uh, some more on the on the sizing as well. Basically, the when uh, several years ago, I. I can't remember exactly the year. Uh, there was a lot of requests from the from the partner and the customer community to sh to kind of uh, show how exactly AX performs on different servers. And Microsoft did an exercise. They called it a day in life benchmark. And what they did, they they went and configured kind of a toy uh, implementation, toy in, uh, AX infrastructure and ran automated jobs that would uh, uh, that that would concurrently do kind of actions in AX. They are not necessarily the user actions. Those jobs were not operating with the UI, but they were creating and deleting orders in the system. And Microsoft timed how how much time does it take to do each action. So if if you look at this kind of table and if you pull this uh, day day in life benchmark. I think it still might be access, uh, accessible online or in the uh, customer base and part, uh, cu customer source and partner source side. But if you don't find them and you want to kind of take a peek, just let us know. Send Greg an email and uh, we will find it. I I might have it from years ago downloaded on one of our servers, so we we can share it. It's 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 publicly available. It's not in kind of behind the scenes. It was available publicly for everyone to see back in the day. It should be available now, but if you cannot find it, uh, do tell us, please. But basically, if you if you look at it, the on the left side from the grid, this was the setup. Obviously, this, uh, right now it's actually kind of fairly standard, but back in the day, many years ago, it was sort of outrageous uh, of a setup. It was over higher end of the set, uh, of the hardware set, setup, but even with that higher end uh, uh, configuration, uh, the 
what you see in the table itself, you can see that the performance scales pretty well. That was basically the key to this exercise, is to test and to show that AX does scale with the hardware, it does scale with the, with the kind of, uh, with the setup. So basically, if you have larger implementation, you add more service, you add more AOS, you, you kind of distribute resources, you add more hardware resources to the mix, and the system scales with it. That means that basically there is no upper limit to how many users can be hosted, how many data jobs, I guess, could be hosted. There is really no limit. It's only a matter of properly considering the, the kind of the system. And you should be able to handle any sort of workload. Also, if you can always, the reason why I'm bringing this day in life benchmark is that you can compare your own experience with this benchmark. And you can say, well, in, in my installations, let's say, in my, in my our organization, we usually have, let's say, 1,000 orders entered daily. How does it look against the Microsoft experience? And you can look at these and these benchmarks and see where do you stand with, with regards to kind of your sizes of your servers and these published benchmarks. Uh, do be kind of a conservative when you look at these because obviously this was published for marketing purposes by Microsoft. So these might be on the kind of optimistic end of the spectrum, but they are, they are, they are real, they are not imaginary. Microsoft did go through this exercise. The system did perform this way with these kinds of sizes. So do look at them. That's, uh, that's a very useful tool. I use it a lot when I try to figure out whether some sizes, whether in some specific implementation, server sizing is adequate. And, and this is just another performance that uh, kind of measure from the same benchmark is how uh, virtualized servers play in this whole uh, calculation. So there, there is a downgrade when you put your servers uh, on the virtual uh, boxes, on your virtual nodes. So these days, it's very common to have most servers virtualized. Back in the day when the day in life was done, it wasn't as common. Uh, and so it, Microsoft did kind of a, did a analysis of how much of a downgrade one should expect if servers are, uh, put on a, on a virtual node. So do look at these if you want to kind of compare your system, your organization with what Microsoft published. Uh, now the next point is very, very important. I cannot stress this enough. As you can see by the, by the percent in the bottom of the screen, one fourth, one quarter of all the cases filed with us uh, the root of the cause for the performance is data. Data itself. There is nothing wrong with SQL, nothing wrong with AOS, with nothing like that. It's data itself. So it is very important to understand that uh, performance is all about perception of the performance. Uh, yes, once you start looking at the performance issues, you will be able to track down and kind of a uh, uh, gauge the performance, put numbers to the performance. But when users report to, to, to you, report the performance issue to you, they perform their perception of the issue, not necessarily an in, uh, inherent issue with the system. So you need to always keep this in mind, that even if users uh, report a problem, it doesn't mean that there is a problem kind of physically in the system they might simply be reporting perception of a problem. They might be, might be accessing large swaths of data at the same time. They might, try, or they might be trying to open a form that hosts hundreds of thousands of records, and they're trying to find a record in there. I have seen many cases when the user would say that the system is slow, but I would go and see what the user is doing and ask them and kind of work with them together. And I would see by the slow, they mean that it takes a lot of time to scroll to the 24,000 of uh, record in the, in, the, in the grid. And to them, it's slow. Obviously, it is. Because they wouldn't know, for example, the idea of the item or the order product. 
and they would need to search for it, find it, literally find it in a, on a screen. So if you have these kinds of, uh, uh, you, your, users, uh, your users have these kinds of experience, you need to work with them closely. Do, uh, do not kind of uh, push them away and say, well, it's, you know, this is just how the data is. Data is a part of performance. It's very important for your users to kind of, uh, to, to be, uh, for your users to have access to the data that is appropriate uh, to, to what the operation, to the operations that they're trying to perform. And the same goes to the reports themselves. If they, your users run a report and that report is slow, then you need to look at reports themselves because sometimes the reports are not designed to specific uh, to, to the specific operations the users are trying to perform. And if users are trying to use a report for some for something it wasn't designed for, it may work, but it may work might work slowly and it might cause might kind of add up to the frustration of your user community. And they will start reporting performance issues uh, even where they may not even exist. So when you get when you get a performance report and you pinpointed that this performance report was uh, performance issue was due to to the data, this these are the steps you need to kind of take. This is uh, especially when you you see that it seems to be uh, it seems to be tied to the data. Your your users are experienced performance because, for example. They, you added a lot of data to the, to the system, or they need to deal with a lot of data. Or then you, for example, they don't know item IDs or product IDs, and you, they need to search by name of the product by, or by some other field in the form. And these are the things you might want to do. Maybe add more indexes. Maybe tell your user, work with your users to optimize the process, to maybe go to another form. Uh, to to maybe even develop some other screen for them. But if nothing else works, you might actually need to kind of roll your sleeves, go into the nitty gritty of the SQL and actually look at SQL execution plan. I have done this a lot, sometimes it's necessary. In that case, you will need to, basically this, this cannot be done by just power users, obviously. This needs to be someone who knows exactly how SQL works, knows how SQL comes up with execution plans and look at them. There's a way to, to interrogate SQL and look at specific execution plans issued by the SQL server. So all of these things need, might need to be explored when you're trying to figure out the data uh, related performance issues. And the last bullet, uh, the last the six, uh, kind of a, I guess, common root of a problem. It's also one fourth of our tickets in the system is issues with the code itself. It's very tightly connected to data, but I kind of, uh, I need to talk about it, but it's not data per se issue, but it's tightly related. There are several ways where the code might cause performance problems. One is, the uh, design of customization. In, in, many, in some cases, even Microsoft's design may attribute, but Microsoft uh, uh, puts a lot of resources into testing, into getting feedback from all of their uh, customer base. So in most cases, Microsoft's uh, code is close to what we might call perfect. It, it works in 99% cases well enough to not cause performance problems. But when we come to, when we get to customizations, that that's where the design sometimes is not ideal. Uh, there are several ways when, when we approach the design of a customization, where the, even at the design decision step, even before developers got their hand on the customization, where the things may go wrong and the design decisions may attribute to future performance. Uh, issues. Uh, some of these things, they're only examples of what you see on the screen. Real-time versus batch processes. When you design some kind of recurrent job, which one you choose. Uh, manual operations versus automated. Do you tell users to click buttons? 
or do you tell users to just flip a flag, let's say, ready for activation of some sort? And then a system will run a bad job and activate that, uh, that entity. Uh, database. Uh, do you tell users to click a button and that will insert hundreds of thousands of records in the database? Do you do that? Do you design your project to do that or do you defer it to some uh, badge job that, that runs overnight? Then implementation details. Once the design is in the books and you're implementing, the developers go and actually implement the design. It's important to properly structure the data tables, the database. Also, it's important to properly structure the code so it doesn't flip between server and client all the time, for instance. Because code in AES runs sometimes, it applies to 2009 and 2012, where the code runs sometimes on the server, but sometimes it actually runs on a client machine. So if you, if you run some heavy data processing uh, and you put it on the client, you, you are kind of up that, uh, performance issue alley. It's, it's a, one of the very common things where performance will degrade. Uh, and so to, to deal with these code problems, you, you want to always have a code review process in your organization. When someone is developing your, your, your customization, you want to review that code. It's a white box review. Uh, we're talking about it's basically looking at the at the code itself and trying to weed out very common and but very damaging kind of bad practices. That's very important. In in our uh, in our company, we do that always. It's the code review is one of the integral parts of how we develop code, and I encourage all of you to do that. The review needs to be done by the more, by your experienced personnel, by system architects. So that they, because they can catch these things on site, but they can all also kind of go through the code, review it, unit test, and maybe find performance issues before they even occur. And best practices. If your developers, especially if you hire new developers, if you have a very young team, an experienced team, go and look at best practices. They're extremely important. They have been established since the very beginning, since exactly since before Microsoft acquired the product. And they have evolved up to this day and keep evolving. Many, many best practices. They have roots to, uh, to the beginning of the system, to that community that created it. And the, uh, the development community kind of supports them all the time. So do look at them and do stay true to the best practices. This is extremely important because this causes performance issues all the time.